आनंद कोटि वैष्णव वृंद की जय नाम आचार्य शिल ठाकुर हरिदास की जय प्रेम से कहो श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री द्वैत गदाधर श्रीवासादि गौर भक्त वृंद की जय श्री श्री राधा कृष्ण गोप गोपीनाथ श्याम कुंद राधा कुंद गिरि गोवर्धन की जय वृंदावन धाम की जय नवदीप मायापुर धाम की जय गंगा देवी की जय कमला मई की जय भक्ति देवी की जय तुलसी रानी की जय समवेत भक्त वृंद की जय श्री हरि नाम संकीर्तन की जय ग्रंथ राज श्रीमद् भागवत की जय इसका देवी थी संस्थापक आचार्य श्री गोपाल की जय गौ प्रेमानंद और गौरी श्री संकीर्तन All glory to the Son of the Lord Jesus. All glory to the Son of the Lord Jesus. All glory to the Three Three Guru and God of the Jaya. Any particular topic someone wants to hear about or questions? One. I want to hear and ask about Vaishnava Paratha and Jiva Paratha, all of Paratha. Paratha. I'm an expert in that field. <laughs> Because most of you people here are Rastas, maybe you can explain a bit about how to lead a perfect life. Well, at first I have to lead a perfect life. <laughs> How can we develop uh, faith in Krishna consciousness and uh, keeping that in center? And then how we... Yeah, that's a good point. If someone wants to hand me Chaitanya Chaitanya Who can... <coughs> it's a big book. Big one. Left hand side. Yeah, there's a red one. Yeah. That's it. <coughs> jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda. Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda. Vaita Chandra Jaya Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Vaita Chandra Jaya Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Vyadvaita Chandra Jaya Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Vaita Chandra Jaya Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Vaita Chandra Jaya Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Now there is a topic that kind of bridges all these suggestions that we've heard. Um, we'll read from Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, Majjhadila, chapter number 19. The Lord instructs Srila Rupa Swami. Actually, you know, I'm going to read from chapter 17 instead. This is, the Lord travels to Vrindavan. When Lord Chaitanya was traveling to Vrindavan, he was in Varanasi. And Varanasi is famous for what? Shiva. Yeah, Vishveshwara Mahadev is their famous, his place. And the Mayavadis, of course, are based there as well. Still, you can find infinite Mayavadis there. So when he went there, 
there was one Marathi Brahmin who invited him. And this Brahmin was distressed because he was hearing so much criticism of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He was criticized as being a sentimentalist, an ignorant person who could only do kirtan like this. It's a common conception. The bhakti path is meant for the easy, and the easy path is meant for the less intelligent people, as if there were no philosophy in bhakti. So, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, this, this Brahmin told the told Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that foolish people will blaspheme you, but do, I shall not tolerate the words of such mischievous people. Uh, because he was extended an invitation for the Lord to take his prasadam there. And Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu replied, the Vedas, Puranas, and great learned sages are not always in agreement with one another. Consequently, there are different religious principles. Sometimes even devotees are not even in agreement with one another. Have you noticed? Dharmas tapan hetu sadhur vyavahar puri goshani raya acharan she dharmasar. This is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu speaking. A devotee's behavior establishes the true purpose of religious principles. The behavior of Madhavendra Puri Goswami is the essence of such religious principles. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur gives the following commentary on this passage. A sadhu, or honest man, is called a Mahajan or a Mahatma. The Mahatma is described thus by Lord Krishna in Bhagavad Gita 9.13. Mahatmanas to maam partha daivim prakadamashtaha pajanti ananya manaso nadva bhudadim avyayam. O son of Pratalos, we're not deluded. The great souls are under the protection of the divine nature. They are fully engaged in devotional service because they know me as the supreme personality of Godhead, original and exhaustible. In the material world, the word Mahatma is understood in different ways by different religionists. Mundaners also come up with their different angles of vision. For the conditioned soul, busy in sense gratification, a Mahajan is recognized according to the proportion of sense gratification he offers. <laughs> Once I had a discussion with a godbrother who was perhaps a little too cynical. And we were talking about the fact that in the absence of Srila Prabhupada, in the last, say, 30 or so years since Prabhupada left, 40 years, you know, there are so many different divisions among devotees even, and people have different, different gurus even have different ideas about what is the ultimate mode of Krishna consciousness. So what do we do in such a circumstance? The obvious answer is coming in a couple of verses, the next verse actually, but I won't jump ahead to that verse. So this God brother, he said, well, what the only, one thing is for sure. If nothing else is certain, there's one thing which is sure, and that is that the next Acharya will be recognized. I mean, we, we, you know, the, the only person who will be recognized is the next Acharya, the self-effulgent Acharya that Prabhupada mentions in his books is the person who offers to the greatest amount, number of people, the greatest amount of sense gratification. He was being facetious. That's what Prabhupada is indirectly hinting at here. I'll read it again for those who missed it. In the material world, the word Mahatma is understood in different ways by different religionists. Mundaners also come up with their different angles of vision. For the conditioned soul busy in sense gratification, a Mahajan is recognized according to the proportion of sense gratification he offers. We're talking about those who are Prakrita Bhaktas. Does everyone know the difference between a Prakrita Bhakta and a Prakrita Bhakta? Prakrita Bhakta means he's 
executing devotional service, but he's on the mundane platform. And therefore, all the mechanics that are applied in this purport to the mundaner, they will, not all of them, but most of them, they will also apply to this person because his vision has not been elevated out of the, out of what Krishna calls dvanva moha in Bhagavad Gita. What does dvanva moha mean? The bewilderment of duality. Duality is very bewildering, isn't it? Anybody here ever been bewildered? <laughs> it's very bewildering, this material world. And really what bewilders us is the achincha shakti of the Lord, which makes things simultaneously one and yet the opposite. That's very hard for us to grasp. It's very hard to deal with that. Anyway, when we are inexperienced in sense gratification, or when we are not blessed by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then uh, when we are inexperienced in Krishna consciousness, or when we are not rece receiving the mercy from the Lord, then we can be, for all intents and purposes, just as bewildered as the conditioned souls. Unless and until we get mercy, or unless and until we advance further in Krishna consciousness. And the entry-level Krishna consciousness is like this, and therefore it's called Prakrita Bhakta, Bhakti. Or sometimes it's also called, uh, you know, we can say Bhakti Abhas, or Chaya, Shadow Bhakti, Shadow. Bhakti with training wheels, maybe, is the best. <laughs> anyway. That's another topic, but Prabhupada is talking about those who are recognized among materialistic persons as Mahajans are the persons who make us happy for whatever reason. And we all have the tendency to glorify anyone who provides us with sense gratification. And as soon as someone tells you where you're really at, <laughs> and then that person becomes a blasphemer, and sometimes we become blasphemers. And in this way, Vaishnava Aparat is multiplied or generated. I mean, Hiranyakashipu, for example, was preaching to his son Prahlad Maharaj in the seventh canto of the Bhagavatam. Because Hiranyakashipu actually believed that Prahlad Maharaj was in Maya. <coughs> this is what happens. The Acharyas commenting on the Chatu Shloki Bhagavatam say that. When one is conditioned by Mahamaya, one cannot perceive the workings of Yoga Maya, and vice versa. And so, we take something to be other than what it is, or it's, it's, it, we become tamasic in our faith, as Krishna describes in chapter 17. Anybody remember from chapter 17 what are the characteristics of tamasic faith? Lazy. Well, that's characteristic of Tamil Guna generally. But a person in Tamil Guna, his, his faith is that dharma is something that's actually a dharma, and a dharma is actually dharma. <laughs> He's therefore striving always in the wrong direction. The poet, the English poet uh, T.S. Eliot, he, he characterized this nicely when he said, from wrong to wrong, the exasperated spirit proceeds. <laughs> That's tamasic faith. He has faith, but it's completely bewildered by this dvanva moha. And therefore, the faith, is the faith is always applied in the wrong place. The, the faith is always reposed in the wrong thing, or in the wrong person, or in the wrong idea, or in the wrong course of action. We heard this morning from His Holiness Jayadvaita Swami, therefore, that the only thing you can really do before the intelligence has been matured is follow the instruction that's been given. And that instruction is not being generated out of whole cloth. The instruction is already existing where? Where do we look for the instructions? How do we determine, according to Krishna in chapter 16, what to do and what not to do? Guru Sadhana Shastra. Huh? Guru Shastra. Yeah, but what does he say? Anybody know the verse? 
तस्मात् शास्त्रम प्रमाणम थे कार्या कार्य विजानता है आज अभी थी आसमान और हस्तरेय He says one should determine what to do and what not to do on the basis of what the shastra tells you to do or not to do. Then there's no question anymore if we just follow what the shastra says, or it's refined a little further by Narottam Das Thakur, who says, "Guru Sadhu Shastra Bako Chite Te Koriya Aiko," or as we sing in the morning at Guru Puja. What is the line? Guru Mukha Padma Vakya Chite Te Kori Aitya. If only we re- really believed in that line and actually applied it. What is the translation? My only wish is to have my consciousness purified by the words emanating from the Lotus Mouth, the spiritual master. Can any of us actually say that honestly? So <clears throat> this is called bhakti apas, shadow bhakti. We 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 practicing to some degree, and we have some faith that we've reposed, hopefully in the right person and process and ideas. <clears throat> But it, we, we don't actually get realization until it matures. Uh, I mean, the, you cannot say it's not bhakti. That therefore, I made a distinction between the mundaner and the mature person. Sri Lavishnath Chakravarti Thakur says it's just like mangoes. Mangoes can be ripe. Our mango, the red mango, is a ripe, soft mango, sweet. And a green mango, which is hard, is not sweet and has opposite properties, according to Ayurved. So devotees are like this, also. They're all devotees. A green mango is still a mango. You can't say it's not a mango. <laughs> it is a mango and nothing else. But immature. This is the thing. Apakva, apai pakva. So, actually, this word pakka, where does it come from? It comes from Sanskrit pakva, pakva, cooked or ripened. So. If we put ourselves into the right association and we follow the process of Krishna consciousness seriously, then we mature, and then we become freed from the illusions of duality, and then the scope for a parad of any kind, or what to speak of other forms of Maya, it's much decreased. So, what are we getting at here? What, 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 What do we really need to do in order to make further advancement from entry-level Krishna consciousness, in which we we don't really feel or look or act very much different than anyone else? What do we have to do? Ah, mercy of Guru. Okay. Sadhu Sangha. Sadhu Sangha, from Sadhu Sangha, and that's the point that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was going to mention next. I'm going to skip ahead here. Um, very heavy statement to think about here. Prabhupada writes, It is those who are devoid of devotional service and sometimes mistakenly accept persons with mundane motives as Mahajanas. The only motive must be Krishna Bhakti, devotional service of the Lord. In the material world, karnamis, fruitive actors, are accepted as Mahajanas by foolish people who do not know the value of devotional service. The mundane intelligence and mental speculative methods of such foolish people are under the control of the three modes of material nature. Consequently, they cannot understand unalloyed devotional service. They are attracted by material activities and they become worshippers of material nature. Thus, they are known as fruitive actors. They even become entangled in material activities disguised as spiritual activities. What are some examples Prabhupada likes to mention? Ah, charity. Yeah, opening hospitals and giving in charity, different things like this. My bodies. 
So, as uh, someone has already mentioned here, Narutam Das Thakur says, Sadhu Shastra Guru Bhakko Chintete Kori Aikya. One should accept as one's guide the words of the sadhus, the Shastra, and the Guru. A sadhu is a great personality like Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The Shastras are the injunctions of revealed scriptures, and the Guru or spiritual master is one who confirms the scriptural injunctions. Excuse me, you said a sadhu like uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Yes. It's like example, right? Mm -hmm. A sadhu is a great personality, like Ch Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The Shastras are the injunctions of revealed scriptures, and the Guru or spiritual master is one who confirms the scriptural injunctions. Accepting the guidance of these three is the actual way of following the great personalities, Mahajans, for real advancement in life. A man covered by illusion cannot understand the proper way. Therefore, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, Dharmas tapan hetu sadhur gibahar. The behavior of the devotee is the criterion for all other behavior. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself followed the devotional principles and taught others to follow them. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu personally followed the behavior of Madhavendra Puri and advised others to follow his behavior. Srimad Bhagavatam 6.320 states that there are 12 Mahajanas. Anybody know who they are? 12 Mahajanas? Four Kumaras. What's the verse? Brahma. Uh, okay, they're listed here actually. Brahma, Narad, Shampu, the four Kumaras, Kapila, Manu, Prahad, Janak, Bhishma, Badi, Shukadev, and to select our Mahajanas in the Gaudiya Sampradaya, we have to follow in the footsteps of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his representatives. His next representative is Sri Sarup Damodar Goswami. And the next representatives are the six Goswamis, Sri Rup, Sri Sanatan, Patarabhunath, Sri Deep Gopalabhata, and Dasarabhunath. A follower of Vishnu Swamis was Sridhar Swami, the most well-known commentator on Srimad Bhagavatam. He was also a Mahajan. Similarly, Chandidas, Vidyapati, and Jayadev were all Mahajanas. One who tries to imitate the Mahajanas just to become an imitative spiritual master is certainly far away from following in the footsteps of the Mahajans. Sometimes people cannot actually understand how a Mahajan follows other Mahajans. Sometimes people cannot actually understand how a Mahajan follows another Mahajan or other Mahajans. In this way, people commit offenses and fall from devotional service. I don't know how to explain that. There are so many so many ways that we could explain that. But the, it comes down to this, that we're, we're bewildered as long as we're conditioned and as long as we're acting on the platform of Prakrita Bhakti, we will not be able to distinguish material from spiritual. We'll take something that is, we'll give the importance of the Supreme Personality of God, Godhead to something that is not the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And the Supreme Personality of Godhead will give the will neglect like something that is not the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That's what Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Tapta says. We always we always tend to do this in material life. So here's a very important verse now that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu quotes. Dharako Pratishta Shrutayo Vidinna Nasa Vrishir Yasyamatam Nabinnam Dharamasya Tatvam Nihitam Guhaya. Mahajano yena gata sapantha. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu continued, Dry arguments are inconclusive. A great personality whose opinion does not differ from others is not considered a great sage. Simply by studying the Vedas, which are variegated, one cannot come to the right path by which religious principles are understood. 
The solid truth of religious principles is hidden in the heart of an unadulterated, self-realized person. Consequently, as the Shastras confirm, one should accept whatever progressive path the Mahajanas advocate. That is such an important verse. Anybody know where that verse is from? Mahabharata. Mahabharata. Spoken by Yudhishthir Maharaj in the Mahabharata Vanaparva 313.117. So Prabhupada has explained a little bit more here in his previous purport. He says, No one can ascertain the absolute truth by following the philosophy of Sankhya or the yoga system of Patanjali, for neither the followers of Sankhya nor the yogis who follow Patanjali accept Lord Vishnu as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Nate vidu swartha gatim hi Vishnu. The ambition of such people is never fulfilled. Therefore, they are attracted by the external energy. Although mental speculators may be renowned all over the world as great authorities, actually they're not. Such leaders are themselves conservative and not at all liberal. However, if we preach this philosophy, people will consider Vaishnavas very sectarian. Srila Madhavendra Puri was a real Mahajan but misguided people cannot distinguish the real from the unreal. We've already discussed this. But a person who is awakened to Krishna consciousness can understand the real religious path chalked out by the Lord and his pure devotees. Sri Madhavendra Puri was a real Mahajan because he understood the absolute truth properly and throughout his life behaved like a pure devotee. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu approved the method of Sri Madhavendra Puri. Therefore, although from the material viewpoint, the Sanodhya Brahmana was on a lower platform, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu considered him to be situated on the highest platform of spiritual realization. Does anybody have any questions or comments? <coughs> yes. Yeah, about uh, the green, green devotee. So what if the green devotee take a situation from green devotees, yeah. what, uh, what benefit and uh, what damage can be from that association? Yeah, well, what happens when devotees, you know, as they say, water seeks its own level? Sometimes devotees who are neophyte, they seek out the association of other devotees who are neophyte. And what are the benefits and what are the potential dangers there? Well, the benefit may be helpful sometimes. There may also be danger sometimes, because the tendency is to nourish each other's anarthas instead of otherwise. We're advised to take more advanced association. That's a key word here, more advanced. And that work like Chaitanya, like a sadhu, like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Can you explain that? What yeah, sadhu like, like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu means he has to be authorized. He has to be transparent. He has to be representing Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He has to be carrying out the same mission and activities and teachings as, as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That means like like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Right. That's how I follow principles. Can Sorry. they consider that like there, there are uh, like uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, if they just follow rules and regulations? Can not, they not they just the same level with the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Following Chaitanya Mahaprabhu means yeah. to accept the authoritative path, the standard path, and to advance on that path. Otherwise, if we're not advancing, we're not following. Therefore, we say that if, a per, if I'm immature, then how am I going to choose the proper authority for my spiritual master? People who are constantly people come and ask me, who should I choose for my spiritual master? And it's a very difficult thing that actually, I mean, I cannot help anybody make that decision. But the idea is that, I guess, you know, how, how do we make that decision? If we're in a bewildered state, how are we going to determine that someone is not bewildered? There are standards. It's, it's just like when you want to go and buy some gold. 
First of all, don't go to Chor Bajar to buy gold. <laughs> they, I mean, there's, there's certain, you, you, the wrong, sometimes the wrong association should be obvious. In India, they have markets that are called Chor Bajar in there. You know, they're, they're, you're giving knockoffs of name brand quality products, but they're not quality products. <coughs> They're also called Maya Bazaar. Sorry? Maya Bazaar is also called. Yeah, yeah. Maya Bazaar. Yeah, it's an illusion. So, the person who is immature is not advised to seek the association of other immature persons because Prabhupada said a blind man leading a blind man, both of them fall into the ditch. This verse from Srimad Bhagavatam is later on uh, found also in the Bible. Did you know that? Christian Bible. Jesus Christ says the same thing. He probably got it from the Bhagavatam, for all we know. Anyway, so the stipulation is that we have to accept the association of those who are more advanced. Swajatiya, they are of the same character, or the same class as ourselves, so that we can relate and feel some sense of identity, but more advanced than ourselves. Now, how do we tell who's more advanced? With green color. <laughs> yeah. How do you? How do? What is? What is it? What is the one thing that actually distinguishes the <coughs> less advanced devotee from the more advanced devotee? Anybody should know the answer to this question. It's very simple. Mm-hmm. Think in terms of adhikar. <coughs> in the eleventh canto of the Bhagavatam, we find three kinds of adhikar described. What are they? Kanishta Adhikar, Madhyama Adhikar, and Uttama Adhikar. And what is the one thing that distinguishes those three levels of advancement? How they see the other person. Consciousness. Who said faith? Faith. Yeah, faith. That's right. That is the principle. Now, can you see another person's faith? No. You have to judge. What is another person's faith by another person's activities and that person's character? As we heard from Jaidwaita Swami this morning, there are standards that are followed by bona fide, well, Mahajanas, those like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. There are standards that they respect. They're not very difficult to perceive. Maybe they're, maybe they're more difficult to follow than they are to perceive. And that's why people sometimes look elsewhere. There are many people who would purport to be pursuing spiritual life, but they're actually more attached to their search than they are to the answers. Anyway, so just like when you go to buy gold, you know that it has to have certain properties. First of all, you've got to know the price of gold, you've got to know what the characteristics of gold are, you have to look for a certain kind of stamp, you have to get it from a reputable dealer, you, so many things. And we do this. We cannot say that we're not informed. We, we cannot <coughs> claim ignorance because we discriminate very carefully in our material life, isn't it? <laughs> when it comes to money, we don't take any chances, right? Maybe we do, I, I don't know. <coughs> When it comes to buying your car, you check it out, or at least you should. Because the effects are visible, I think, in material life. That's the thing. That's the thing. Therefore, in the in the uh, in the Purva Mimamsa school, they call it adrishta. Ad, <laughs> we can't see. So, visible means that you can experience very quickly the result of your foolishness. Yeah. <laughs> if you go to buy a car for you know buy a lemon from someone. For example, in spiritual life, you know, you don't necessarily see it right away. And even other people don't necessarily see it. Because there's plenty of people who don't want to see it. (laughs) Prabhupada said, you can wake up a person who's sleeping, but you cannot wake up a person who's only pretending to be asleep. (laughs) And we have this in this material world. Somebody who's actually not ignorant at all, knows very well what he's doing but he's playing dumb, <laughs> right? Just like when we go on Sankirtana here, uh, because there's so much ever-increasing Latino population in Southern California, 
So sometimes you try to distribute books, and no peak English. <laughs> they do speak English. <laughs> 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 anyway, so this is the idea. A person has to be honest, therefore. In the Kali Yuga, this honesty is the very last leg of the bull called Dharma. The, you know, the austerity is already gone. The cleanliness is already gone. Right? Mercy is already gone. But there's a little bit of honesty, and only through that avenue, the one poet, Hindi poet, his name is Bihari. He wrote a book called Bihari Satsai. And he says that through what door shall Lord Hari enter the heart if it's jammed shut with kapak? <laughs> <laughs> Cheating. Cheating religion. Kaitava. How, how's he going to get in if you, if you closed up, sealed every entrance? You know, case hardened lock, you know, plastered it over. I mean, wh what's he supposed to do? If you really don't want to be woken up, then you will not never be woken up. This is the way it works, and Krishna's not going to push. Upadrishtanu Mantacha, he's sitting within the heart, he's watching everything, he's monitoring everything, he's giving good intelligence, but it's up to you to take it. Once I heard a lecture from one senior god brother, this is maybe 40 years ago, and he was talking about the process of surrendering to Krishna, Every one of us has to do that on our own. Nobody else can do it for you. And nobody else sees if you're not doing it also. At least not for a while. After some time, then the symptoms become evident. And generally, as Rohapada Swami put it very nicely, he said, the nature of Bhakti Devi is that Bhakti removes an artas. If we associate with the path of Bhakti, our anartas will be removed. And if we cling to those anartas, then we will be removed along with them. So that's what happens after, sometimes we see after 10, 20 years, the devotee goes away, because actually there was something kapat inside, being very carefully cherished and harbored and protected. And when it became overwhelmingly obvious to that person that he was not or she was not going to have their motive fulfilled by devotional service, because actually we don't gain anything from this. You think you're going to get money from this? Respect? Knowledge, perhaps, if you're subtle? You're not going to get anything. You're only going to get love if you do it right. And if you do it, do it wrong, then you're not going to get that. So people, after some time, people figure out there's nothing for me here, that what I really want is somewhere else, and then they go. And sometimes it takes a long, long time, because it's Kali Yuga, and we're all sumandamati. Manda sumandamati. Very dull, lazy, misguided, unfortunate, unlucky, disturbed, all the things that characterize this Kali Yuga. So... <clears throat> Generally, when we associate with others who are just neophytes, uh, sometimes we see that you know the, the bhaktas or the bhaktis, they get together and just nourish each other's in our tubs. <laughs> they don't actually help each other. Sometimes they pull each other out. Therefore, it's, dis it's, it's always qualified that you seek the association of more advanced devotees, and we define that as the devotee whose faith is deeper than yours, but like yours. And this is another important point. You cannot be expected to repeat to what, what are the six exchanges that Goswami says in Upadesh Amrita? Giving gifts. Giving gifts. Accepting gifts. What else? And disclosing the mind. Disclosing the mind and Pushnak, right? Inquiring confidentially. What else? There's that's four of them. Giving prasad acceptance. Yeah, giving giving an you cannot be expected to do all of these six things with a person that you cannot relate with at all, right? We have to respect all devotees, but we do not have to embrace the association of all devotees. Even if someone is more advanced to you, if you cannot relate in any way, it, it will be very difficult, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says. Therefore, Goswami has specified again here, 
Sajatya. Swajatya. Somebody within your own group. Somebody like you. And that's general. Maybe like you means according to your in your own race, in your own gender, in your own you know faith, in your own caste, whatever. In your own profession, perhaps, it's, it's general. <coughs> but when we see that a person appears to be more serious in Krishna consciousness than us, but in ways that we can, we, we can, we can relate to, then that is the association we should take. That is what takes us from being green to a ripe mango. And therefore it's advised that we should always hear the Bhagavatam in the association of devotees who are more advanced those whose faith is deeper than that. Now, where do you get faith that he's already said through satsanga, sadhu sangha? When you associate, it's natural. And it's something that is very mis mystical. How is it that our faith is awakened through just by associating with someone? The Shastra says that even if you associate with a pure devotee, like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, or like Srila Prabhupada, even for eleventh of a second. What can you actually do in eleventh of a second? Can you have any sort of meaningful exchange on it? Is there any sort of didactic in exchange? Not possible. There is something mystical about association. I mean, one of the benefits of association, as we've already described, is guhima uh, khyati pratiti. We discuss Krishna consciousness, that takes more than eleventh of a second. But even if we only see a pure devotee, even if we only get the remnants of a pure devotee, that association is very powerful and can elevate our faith. So that's something to consider. Is that okay? Yeah, it's like a, a small thing about what happens if uh, someone worship. Uh, um, I, I cannot say green guru, but if guru did something wrong, or the disciple have no enough, I mean, complete faith, and still worship that person, what can happen? There are so many possibilities. Either the spiritual master may not be bona fide, or the disciple may not be, the spiritual master is bona fide, but the disciple's not bona fide. The guru has to be bona fide, the disciple has to be bona fide. And the exchange has to be broken, and then the advancement will happen. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. There's it looks like a, a spoiled life, right? You Sorry. It's just like spoiled life. You know. Well, not completely wasted. You I mean, everything everything happens according to our desire. If you really want guidance more than anything else in the world, Krishna is going to give it to you. This is why the Ritvik proposal doesn't work. It's not valid. Because Krishna says, I reciprocate according to one's, the, the, the intensity of one's desire. If he's sincere, he's going to get the guidance that he wants. How so? Teisham satata yuktaram pajatam priti purvakam dadami uti yogam tam. I give him the intelligence, Krishna says. Teisham evanu kampartham aham agnana jamtama. So many places in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, if you want guidance, it will be there. We just have to make the decision. And it is a decision. It's like a light switch. I mentioned earlier, nobody else can surrender for us. We have to do it ourselves. That means you have to lift up your arm, you have to walk over the wall, and you have to flip the switch. <laughs> Otherwise, the lights don't go on. We have to do that. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, recently, I have read a reference from Harilila Chintamani, which states that the human life is also because of Agnata Sukriti. It's not a, a progression from lower lives. Out of eight million four hundred thousand forms, even to get a human life, is uh, you should have Agnata Sukriti. You read this where? Harilila Chintamani. Harilila Chintamani. I'm not familiar it's, uh, with that book. It's a reference given in, you know, it's from LA Live Sessions. They have it from Harini Rachita. Anybody know this book? No. You're not talking Harini Rachita. Maybe Harini Rachita. Yeah. yeah. So. Probably. Anyway, uh, so your, your question is? To, 
to get a human life it's also agnata sukruti it's not automatic progression from lower no i my understanding is that it's automatic if you burn off all of your other karma and are left with only human karma then you 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 automatically are promoted to the human species but it may take many 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 lifetimes that's the thing there are not only are there 8,400,000 other options but how long are you going to spend in each one you know so you know it's very rare to get the human form of life it's very fortunate and within the human form of life to to get any kind of sukriti is also very fortunate so what to speak i mean here we are we're all human beings we're sitting here in nudwarka dham and we're discussing krishna consciousness as taught by shila propa I mean, we've already come 90% of the way <laughs> if you look at it from this broad perspective we've got a human form we found the bona fide guru we've got some faith in the process and we're practicing to whatever extent we are you see so we should appreciate that and be encouraged by that and uh, by seeking the association of those who are more advanced we can we can advance even further in the way that we can advance you cannot advance in a way that somebody else can advance this is an important thing therefore krishna says twice what verse paraswa dharma what is that para dharma sanushtata what is the verse ha shrayans va dharma vikunaha para dharma sanushtata it is better to do your own dharma than to try to do somebody else's dharma because you're not somebody else Swajati, stick to your own class and do your own thing and pursue Krishna consciousness in that way. Otherwise, it's not going to be very easy. Uh, probably you were saying that uh, for us to progress, you have to. If your your desire is sincere, then you will actually get an association of somebody from where you can progress. Yeah. Sometimes even to get the desire, you need to associate. You know? Yeah. like so how do you it seems like circular you know it is circular <laughs> and you know this is kind of like the argument that you know offensive chanting offen- offenseless chanting you know is is what purifies you so if i'm offensive chanting then what to do but you 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 do get you you become purified by osmosis <laughs> even if the chanting is offensive slowly slowly that it works but we build up momentum and the the built in advantage for us is that was what krishna says ne hape kramanashosti pratyavayo nidityate there's no diminution here whatever you build up you don't go down from that point unless you commit a parat and that is the main reason <coughs> to get out of the green stage as soon as possible because the green stage is the vulnerable stage the green stage is where you're going to make all your mistakes and commit all your offenses it's a liability the green stage the, the that's in other words called kanishta adhikar in the kanishta state one sees himself as the devotee sees everyone else as a non-devotee sees that krishna is only in the temple and he doesn't exist anywhere else he gets bewildered and he argues about my worship of my mode of worship is better than your mode of worship this is this is kanishta so those are the pr- people who are committing mm-hmm. offenses generally but even if you are an advanced devotee it's we have to always be very careful to avoid offenses i'm com- a little bit deviating from your question i think i got i'm sorry uh, i think you answered uh, the circular part yeah another yes. aspect is for even i have i've noticed that as long as a devotee is not very close when when he's when you're not taking active association by like being with him very close you're you don't know about him you basically look at him from a distance you don't make offenses but once you once some um, you start associating somebody very closely because of you know my limitation or something i start seeing uh, you know drawbacks in that devotee and start making offenses you know it seems to be uh, association seems to be the only way but there seems to be a lot of you know uh, Uh, problems or I don't know how to remember. Here in Dwarka, in around 1970, Srila Prabhupada 
began the process of what he described as boiling the milk of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. He had made so many devotees, and there were so many centers, and everything was going on nicely, but Prabhupada wanted to turn up the flame a little bit. And he instituted this morning program that we have, and so many of the traditional practices that all Vaishnavas do, but that were not done in ISKCON prior to that point. And Prabhupada said he wanted to boil the milk. It's, it's just like, or another analogy is given, boiling ghee. When you make ghee, what happens? All the solids come up, and you have to clear them off. So when we put ourselves in potent association, then stuff that was not visible in other association, it starts coming out, and we think, wait a minute, what's going on? I feel worse now than I was before I started. <laughs> What's another example? When you sweep a room that has not been cleaned for years. You know, sometimes if the dust is left alone, it's just better to leave it that way because it's so filthy. If you start, if you go into a room that hasn't been cleaned in a decade and you try to start sweeping, you're going to make a real mess. A really, really big mess. And you're not going to be clean in time for lunch. <laughs> it's going to take some time, you see. So this is what it's like also in Krishna consciousness in the beginning, when we first seriously put attention and volition, more importantly, into this process, then we start to see that, wow, I'm really looking pretty bad. <laughs> I, am I making some mistake or what's going on? Actually, that's a good sign. It's, it's when we don't feel like that that we, we need to worry. Complacence. We, we, get, we get purified. And when we are in the intensity of close association with devotees, all of the stuff that was otherwise lying invisible, hrichaya, within the heart, is exposed by nature of that potent association, by the spiritual potency of the environment. In ourselves it becomes exposed, in other people it becomes exposed, and that's when we have to be really careful, because we start to see. And the tendency is, again, there's scope for committing a parath there. So, Janami Janami Hoye Abhilash, Srila Prabhupada quoted Narutam Das Thakur so often, we always want to stay in the association of devotees, life after life after life, even if it's more difficult sometimes, and, and seems even counterproductive at times. Sometimes it is counterproductive, if we're doing something wrong, or someone else is doing something wrong. This is why we need to seek the more advanced devotees association who can guide us and clarify things. Is that okay? Somebody over here was raising. Oh, the same question. Okay. And you mentioned about uh, having human birth is kind of very fortunate. So when, it, when compared with the animals and other species, insects, it's sure, I agree with that. But when compared with the demigods, it's still fortunate enough? Or? Yes. Can you Everybody heard this answer? It looks like a lot of distraction in the back at the kitchen table. <laughs> the boy at the back had a question. Okay, just bookmark your question and we'll take his. For those who didn't hear, the question is, the human form of life is a great advantage for Krishna consciousness, but what about forms of life that are considered superior to the human being, such as demigods and svargaloka? Who knows the answer to this question? Is that also a, a, a greater advantage than the human form? No. 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 What's wrong with the demigods? No, no. Uh, uh, too much, much happiness. <laughs> lot of material pleasures available. Too much too sense much. gratification. It's just like we heard the other day. Devotees in Ukraine, as opposed to devotees in Hawaii, <laughs> there's a very big difference. It's a noticeable difference. When you're really suffering, it's actually a good thing for bhakti, even though it's not very pleasant. And when, you're, when everything is just great, that's like, you know, you've allowed the dust to settle, settle to a comfortable degree, and, and you don't have to deal with it so much. You see? Therefore, Krishna puts us under, the, under, the, under pressure from time to time. Because, you know, it's, it's not expected that a conditioned soul is always going to be very eager to undergo tapasya. So is it correct to say like having turbulent life or some maya in 
it's going to help you for probably spiritually. The question is, is it therefore correct to say that having a turbulent life or having some maya is going to help you advance in Krishna consciousness? Well, we've got to define our terms here, I think. Um, you know, some maya in the form of turbulent life, I think, is what you mean, yeah. Well, it's actually not necessarily maya. That's the point. If we shut this door, then the flies don't join us for dinner. I know, because I'm living here, I know. <laughs> So, sometimes the turbulence in our life is, is maya, and sometimes the turbulence in our life is not maya. Sometimes it's Krishna's mercy. What do we call it? Tough love. <laughs> Tough love. Sometimes it takes this. I mean, you know, when the child is, na is naughty, then you turn him over to a stern uncle, and the stern uncle will do the needful. <laughs> and it's not very pleasing for the child, but it's good for the child. And we are only doing it because of love. You see? So Krishna's like that. He tells Arjuna, He's not forcing anybody. You do what you want. I've told you everything. You've understood everything. Now it's your choice. You can, as you wish. But please understand that Either you, if you don't serve me and reciprocate with me in loving devotion, then you know Maya is going to take you and just beat you to death. So sometimes it's Maya in that way, but sometimes it's actually Krishna's personally monitoring monitoring the whole process because he's taking a personal interest in us. Isn't that encouraging? You can see this as Maya's test, but it's much much more encouraging to see that this is Krishna's love. Is it not? Krishna cares enough about me that he's putting me through this difficulty. Let me, let me see if I can prove myself to him. And we get infinite opportunities because this mature world is offering so much misery, isn't it? At every step there's a challenge. Whatever maya you're in, it doesn't make any difference. It's not going to change the mechanics of this operation. This place is difficult, period. And... Uh, it's, it's our own vantage point that is the pivot. <coughs> is that okay? Shashi to love. Uh, you may follow the four basic principles for years and years and years. And the challenges will come years after years, every day, or maybe every month. Uh, how do we know Krishna is, how, I mean, how do you know we're loving Krishna? How do we know that? <laughs> You know, there was a devotee, the story here in Los Angeles, I think. They used to have over here where this, uh, what is there now? Near the farmer's market, there was a supermarket there. Right. The Aliens Market. Yeah. Remember that place? Yeah. So, devotee was, Prabhupada asked him to go buy an eggplant. So, he went and bought an eggplant. And when he came back, he told Prabhupada, you know, the whole time I was in complete maya, I was just looking at all that, it just, I, mean, it, you know, I just could, it totally forgot Krishna. Prabhupada said, did you get the eggplant? Bus. Yasya prasada, Bhagavad prasado. Ityadi. If we please the spiritual master, then we get mercy and we advance. If we don't please the spiritual master, then we don't advance. Period. And how do we know that we're pleasing the spiritual master? It's, we mentioned it a moment ago with regard to this shastras. You follow the instructions. And the instructions are not so abstruse, not so difficult. I mean, in the sense that they're not hard to understand. They're difficult, perhaps, in the sense that we don't want, wish to follow them. But uh, it's like Jayadvaita Swami said this morning, you chant your rounds, you come to the temple, you associate with devotees, you follow the principles, you read the books. Read the books! <laughs> Did you hear that? Read the books! Four or five times in this lecture I've asked people for verses and I get no response. I don't know how else to interpret that. These books are there. Prabhupada said, without knowledge you cannot perform voluntary tapasya. And without hearing, you cannot cultivate knowledge. You've got to hear. Guru Mukha Padma Bhakta Chitte Te Kori Aikya, I mentioned already. We cannot honestly say that our only desire is to be purified by hearing from the words of our spiritual master. 
that's a big problem, and Prabhupada noticed it, even in those days. And I think it's gotten worse since Prabhupada left. I can say this from a, from a historical perspective as one of Prabhupada's initiates. So, is that okay? Does it answer your question? Anything else? Yeah. yeah. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, crying is a great transcendental pleasure. What's your view on this? Crying? Yeah. Okay, where did Chaitanya Mahaprabhu say this? Just out of curiosity. Uh, I don't know. You don't know? Neither do I. No, I just read something. Okay, crying is a great transcendental... Well, if it's transcendental crying, yeah. I will not disagree with that. Srila uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says it's like dry ice. Mm -hmm. I've been reading Padyavali lately. And there the commentator is describing the sentiments of Srimati Radharani, who is, uh, many of the verses are attributed to Srimati Radharani. Even though they also manifested in this world through the mouths of mundane poets in some cases. That's an interesting thing. But the gopis, and especially Srimati Radharani, they're constantly criticizing and complaining about Krishna. And they're constantly crying because of things that Krishna says or does. But that's actually transcendental ecstasy, no matter how vehemently they object to it. And that's like dry ice. We cannot understand how something that is ice cold can burn you. But dry ice does that. Similarly, we cannot understand how the misery that is, dis that is explained by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his Shikshastika, for example, which is one of the Padyavali verses also. Uh, the whole Shikshastika is actually there in the Padyavali. There are commentaries on it. So how is it that how is it that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu expresses these uh, very painful emotions, and yet we consider that transcendental ecstasy? It's not very easy for us to understand. In fact, it's impossible for us to understand. Uh, in exactly the same way that you cannot explain sex life to a juvenile, that they just don't have the capacity to really appreciate it. So, we have to mature spiritually, that's all. But crying can be transcendental pleasure. Crying, unfortunately, can also be mundane misery. And we cannot always tell the difference because our faith is tamasic or we're at the Kanishta Dikar platform or green mangoes, in other words. See, so we have to be careful there. Is that okay? I have one more question. If we associate with devotees, then we, we get a better sense. Other question is, if one is a poor man, Krishna said, one is a poor man, he can go to his friend's house and accept food, but he can never accept residence in others' house. Okay. Then what about rich man, and why is this, what, what is the inner sense of this statement? Okay. He can accept food, but he cannot accept residence in others' house. Okay, is this a question about Krishna consciousness? I, I'm not seeing the question. Yes, yeah, it is in Krishna consciousness. So um, what, what, is you, what are you asking? Recently I liked uh, one of the Facebook pages of Krishna's and in that uh, some Swamiji posted this. Right, okay. Is, uh, oh, uh, can I, uh, I think I, uh, I understand the example okay. from one incident in the Mahabharata, for example. All right. uh, you probably know. When, uh, Krishna went to us, you know, when they made the plot, Duryodhana, Shakuni, he's going to go, Krishna, there to Dwarka. So please, you know, do your best to invite Krishna. And then, uh, obviously, Krishna didn't want to go and eat, and he said, I can only eat in the... But in general, I mean, that's, of course, Chani Kipanit also said the same thing. One should never reside in another person's house. You can't be happy like that. That's not a permanent, <laughs> you know under some circumstances perhaps, but I mean that's not not that you spend your whole life living in other people's houses. <laughs> okay. What? I have an observation for what it's like a comment. <laughs> uh, I see in the situation of many devotees, unfortunate situation where they they met Prabhupada and at the same time for whatever anarchas they had, they never surrendered to Prabhupada when he was physically present. Then later on, they, they tried to uh, still s searching for gurus, but they, they were never, never were able to actually 
find someone like, let's say, Prabhupada. And uh, would that be like a lack of humility on the part of the uh, person searching for Guru also when tries to find like a person that it has to be exactly just like Prabhupada, but they can't find it. So would that be would that be also let's say a person that is looking for someone and he cannot find that? Uh, yeah, I said earlier. Sometimes you know we're more attached to searching than we are to finding. Mm-hmm. I mean, there there are so many things can explain that sort of behavior. I wouldn't want to make any judgment. Yeah. About. I mean, this you know it's it's a pretty it's a pretty wide open topic. I think. But in general, the, the point that we should always remember is that if we want to advance in Krishna consciousness, it will not be frustrated. Krishna will facilitate it, period. Because that's he, he wants that more than we want it. Because I see sometimes you, they read the books, you, they, they ask the same questions. I have here in my mind many friends in a long time ago. Same questions all the time. Yeah. And uh, they got the answers in different ways, but still they couldn't uh, so that, that they yeah, got Sometimes given. we don't like to hear the answers because we want other answers. You know? And, you know, you can't satisfy somebody who, want, who doesn't want what you're selling. <laughs> you know, we were talking this morning about diamonds. You know, if you want to buy a diamonds, you've, you've got to pay a, a good amount of money to get them. Otherwise, if you don't want diamonds, then, you know, you can get cubic zirconia, and they cost very little, and they look, to most people's eyes, they look just like diamonds. But, you know, the problem is that people buy the cubic zirconia and call them diamonds. Then that's, <laughs> that's not right. And even worse than that, sometimes the merchant buys cubic zirconia and calls them diamonds. <laughs> and that's, that's even worse. So similarly, you know, in this, in this material world, if we want real spiritual life, then, you know, we have to be prepared to pay that price. Prabhupada said, if I just relax these four regular principles, I could have so many millions of followers. That's one example. But there are standards, and that's, that's what makes us bona fide. I'm not sure I understand your question. No, Krishna said in Bhagavad Gita always yeah. worship to me, uh, obeisances to me, love and me. And Bonafide Guru also gives, he repeats the same thing, love Krishna. Yeah. Period. Prabhupada never said, the, I mean, he could have called it the International Society for Bhaktivedanta Swami Consciousness. <laughs> he didn't do that because he wanted to focus our attention on Krishna. That's what a Bonafide Guru does. It looks like a Guruji. I mean, what representative, it's okay, but some Guruji, different levels, it looks like obstacles to love Krishna, because that love goes to that will. Yeah, that's wrong. That's what you want. Yeah. Attaching it, worship, everything. Yeah, that's, that's what Prabhupada was talking about before. A person is actually not focused on Krishna. He's focused on something non-Krishna. And therefore, the person is going to be frustrated. That means how to properly make a relationship with Guru or female. Sorry? Because when you worship someone like Guru, to stay uh, like in a distance from attachment and that love uh, that belongs to Krishna, how to... Yeah, we have to see the spiritual master in terms of his relationship to Krishna. We have to see everyone in terms of their relationship to Krishna. And we have to be Krishna conscious rather than other people conscious. Even Guru. Yes. So that love completely belongs to Krishna. Yeah, but Krishna tells us 
you go to me through this person. That's why attaching the old will be there. Then Therefore, we say he's transparent. Transparent means you see right through him. You're not doing anything. You're, you're not approaching Krishna by any means other than your spiritual master, but your spiritual master has no significance other than the fact that he's a representative of Krishna. That's the point. So That's that, what it means to be transparent. It seems like uh, still in a woman body, we have to wake up next life and get a woman body, and everything will be fixed. No, that's and, proper. And female body, it's very really difficult to stay from the wrong attachment. I try being a man. <laughs> it's not easy, huh? The women have certain advantages, the men have certain advantages, and they each have certain disadvantages. And You know, you've got to deal with what you've got, and you have to tolerate whatever difficulties are there, and just push. And Krishna will facilitate if you're sincere. And it's another word, if even he's a real a bona fide spiritual master, why not love him? Why Krishna said, me? Well, the spiritual master is transparent. You can't find him. All you can see is Krishna. It's like Prabhupada. Well, what is Prabhupada if not Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama? Do we go to Srila Prabhupada to talk about politics or to get advisement for investments or you know, to buy a car? Or, I mean, someone. <laughs> Srila Prabhupada is all about Krishna. That's what bona fide Guru means. He's representing Krishna only. Hurry up. Anything else? Yeah, here. Yeah, just, um, because I had a question and I wanted to expand that. Um, you want to know if you could explain duality? My question well. is how do you um, accept or um, come to grips with it? Okay. Well, duality means that in this material world we're always bewildered by opposites. Hot, cold, rich, poor, man, woman, young, old, adi, adi, adi. And <clears throat> it creates problems because we get attached to a certain paradigm and then the opposite comes along and destroys our paradigm. So we have to tolerate that, Krishna says, just like it's hot in the summertime and it's cold in the wintertime. I'm not sure uh, what else to say, because I'm not sure maybe what the significance of the question is. So, how do you accept and come to grips with the uh, diverse um, scenarios that are presented to you? How do you keep your uh, balance in those scenarios? Balance. Balance means? That you're not disturbed. Yeah, that's by practice practice in good association with knowledge, as I said earlier, by chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, 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 Hare Hare. We follow the process of Krishna consciousness and gradually, gradually we come more fixed in self-realization and the natural characteristic of that self-realization is that we are less disturbed by other things. It's, it's a gradual process. We have to be patient, we have to be determined, we have to be properly guided, etc. Rupa Goswami has described you, Is that okay? It's a general answer because the question is also very general. A few moments ago there was a question around the corner, is that it? Yeah, that was it. Okay. How practical it is for the current generation to practice the statement of Srila Prabhupada, simple living and high thinking? Oh, this is a huge, huge topic. Simple living and high thinking. Actually, Prabhupada, that's not just Prabhupada, as you know. Yeah. yeah. That comes from Gandhi and it comes from ultimately from Shastra also. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's always possible to live a dharmic life if you want to, but to the extent that we don't, then things get worse in such a manner as to make it harder. You cannot erase what is eternal, sanatan dharma. The eternal nature of this world cannot be changed. Simple living, high thinking, living in accordance with the laws of nature, that is the way that we live in this world. But the extent to which we ignore that and pervert that creates difficulties in actually realizing that aim. Yeah, if the 
helicopter's gone, we can open up. It's getting too warm. So, for example, so how practical is it in the current generation? Well, it, it, each generation, it becomes harder and harder. That's the nature of Kali Yuga. And it's now been about at least one or two generations since Prabhupada gave the instruction that he said was the remaining 50% of his mission, in which he was very strongly emphasizing the socio-economic ideals of, of all people, Mahatma Gandhi. Prabhupada's teachings on the socio-economic level are not distinguishable from those of Gandhi. It's when he comes to philosophy and theology that the distinction is there. And Prabhupada instructed his disciples that he saw having difficulties, how to live properly in this world so as to minimize those difficulties. But we've neglected that, in my opinion. I mean, that's not really opinion. You can look around and see that in most cases it's not been, we don't have much to show, Shiva Prabhupada, in terms of accomplishing that instruction in a practical way. And it's granted, it's difficult, it's not easy. But, you know, at least we have to start seriously discussing it and researching it and making sure that we understand what it, what it is that Prabhupada asked of us. That's probably the first step and the only one that we can take at this point, in, in my view. Is that okay? Yeah, for example, he suggested farm communities, right? Yeah. For that, we need at least minimum thing is the water, which is becoming very difficult in India also. A toxicologist in Houston told me there is no aquifer in the United in the North America, not just the United States, all of North America. There is not a single aquifer that is not contaminated with mercury, cadmium, arsenic, runoff from you know industry, from agriculture, etc. They're all contaminated. Mm -hmm. The air is contaminated. The, the basic elements of material existence, bumir abon alovayu kamano butirevachetyadi, all of them are contaminated. Yeah. We are also contaminated. The ahamkara, the, the buddhi, the, the manas, everything contaminated. So Kali Yuga is like that. So I didn't say it would be easy. And I did say that in every generation it becomes harder. Yeah. But somebody has got to pay the bill here. Somebody has got, you've got to pay for dharma in this yuga. You've got to pay financially. You've got to pay money. It costs. I was discussing with someone the other day, I don't remember who. Um, you know, nowadays you have polyester dhotis. <laughs> 30 years ago in Vrindavan, you could not find such a thing because it didn't exist. It was all khadi, all 100% pure cotton. So if you wanted to wear cotton dhoti as the Shastra advises, then you've got to pay. You see my point? You want pure water, you've got to pay money to go get this, you know, what do they call, you know, so many brands now. I mean, they, you don't even know what they actually, and in India it's even worse. Then it will also be cyclic, like if you are living simply, you don't have that much money to pay. The point is that we're all very attached to this dream, and that's the only reason that we are not accomplishing more in this area, because this is where the rubber hits the road, folks. What are you going to do at ground level in your day-to-day -day life? That is the technicolor manifestation of your Krishna consciousness. If you're still selling out to the American dream and the demons who run it, and you're patronizing them in effect, then, you know, that's grade Z Krishna consciousness. It's not what Prabhupada asked for. And it's not easy to hear this. And for that reason, it's also not very easy to say this, you know. But uh, these instructions are standing. And Prabhupada said them many, many times. He said them clearly, he said them urgently, he said them increasingly. And he directed them squarely at us, his initiated disciples. So it's very, very difficult to ignore these instructions without forging a varad. That's a strong statement. Continuing the same question, like, how do you define symbols? One person yeah. said, the other guy has 16, 16 inches TV, I have only 12 inch TV, I'm simple. This is so. a very good point. 
My frame of reference for this to answer that question, how do you define simple? That's the question. It's relative, is it not? But there is a standard, again. Shruti, uh, what is it? Shruti Pratyaksha Aiti Hyam Anumanam Chitushtayam. In the 11th canto, Krishna tells Uddhava, there are four pramanas by which you can understand what to do and what not to do in this world. Anybody know what they are? We usually hear three, isn't it? Pratyaksha. 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 Anumana. Anumana. Shabda. And what's the fourth one? Aitihya. Yeah. Nobody knows that one. There's a little tiny verse hidden away in the 11th canto, which our charges actually quote quite a bit. For some reason that I don't understand, I have not seen Prabhupada quote it. Aitihya. What does Aitihya mean? A traditional precedent. The pre-existing <coughs> standard coming since time immemorial. Up until about 200 years ago, this world has been very sustainable. Human societies on this planet have been very sustainable. Around the time of the scientific revolution, everything started going haywire, and look at the mess we're in now. We don't even know if we're biologically correct human beings. What does people scripturally correct? <laughs> and wait until the clones start to grow up. I mean, first of all, to be a human being according to the Shastra, that's one thing. But even, you know, to consider whether you're biologically correct human being, we're not sure anymore. It's really a mess, but it's only going to get worse. And how bad? You're going to find midgets at the end of Kali Yuga. The day is coming very pretty soon when people will refuse to believe that there was ever such a thing as this fantastic creature called an amphibian. <laughs> right? Just like when we read Bhagavatam and we don't believe it when we, see, we hear about mountains flying. The material nature has been tweaked because it's tweakable. This is the problem. And it's only going to get much worse. As long as, he, you know, one of my god brothers told me, you only get more of whatever you tolerate. If you tolerate it, it's just going to come more and more and more. You've got to declare war. And that's what Prabhupada was doing. Look at the radical steps that he took to do what he did. It was not less than warfare, but, you know, in a positive sense. Is that okay? Yeah. I, I told you this is a huge topic. We can go all night with it. But I, I hope that's okay. Yeah, yeah you have a question? Uh, I have a question. Like, uh, when there are difficult, unfavorable situations for the spiritual life, how do we know that is because of our bad choice or it is uh, Krishna's enemy? Because if it is yeah, our choice, then uh, we don't get as much help as the Krishna's enemy. Right. Everybody heard the question? When we have to undergo reverses in life, how do we know whether it's Krishna's arrangement or whether it's just a bad choice I made? Okay, first half of the answer. Whatever we experience in this life, whether happiness or distress, it's already written on your forehead. You cannot change it. It's going to happen. So what you do the choices that you make in this life have absolutely no bearing on the enjoyment or suffering that you get. Do you believe that? To some extent. <laughs> yeah, that's the point. We don't have full faith. We have some faith. I mean, think about money again. Usually when you bring it down to money, people get interested and it, it, and it actually starts to mean something. You know? You work your... I mean, you, you can work your tail off your whole life and you're not going to get anywhere more than what is destined to you at the day you were born. That's a pretty hard pill for most people to swallow. <laughs> we are constantly encouraged that you can make a difference. And our mind is, is you know, the dream that impels us in our material endeavors is, is also encouraging within, within sight. You know, within. And so we, 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 we rebel against this idea to a large degree. But the fact of the matter is that Likitam api lalate pransitam kaha samartha Hitopajesh says Whatever the product of karma is written in this indelible barcode on your forehead that only devas can read you cannot change that. 
So, therefore we say that uh, an intelligent person does not endeavor for things you know, to, to, to try and change his material station. That's one thing. But then to answer your actual question, how do we then tell what is the difference between my karma, perhaps, because we're talking about karma here. How do I know the difference between my Pradabdha karma and Krishna's arrangement? Who knows the answer to this? If you have, let's say you have to undergo some suffering. Is it because I've got bad karma, or is it because Krishna is showing me some special mercy, or maybe Krishna is chastising me, or, or what? Right? Who knows? Who can answer this question? Krishna is using all bad karma to be pious. Okay, that's a smart answer. Anything else? Depends upon your consciousness. Depends upon your consciousness. So that, does that mean that if I refuse to believe that it's my bad karma, then it's actually Krishna's mercy? <laughs> no, if I'm very Krishna conscious, then I can, I can think like, oh, if, the, if there's a worse situation, I could think it could have been worse than this, but Krishna's protecting me. Okay, but that's the Krishna conscious solution. That's, that's coming out of the realm of karma altogether. And that's ultimately the ideal. So I will put this. Even, even you make choice, it's still according to my karma. Yep. It's looks right. like there is no new karma. It's That's like right. cycle. That's right. So everything put head in Krishna's mercy. Sorry? Everything put head in Krishna's mercy. I didn't hear Everything you. put head in it's Krishna's mercy. No. Every no. choice. No. no, no, no. So what? Sometimes it's karma, sometimes it's Krishna. And how do you tell the difference? You don't. <laughs> <laughs> He's not going to give away that secret. <laughs> He keeps you guessing, because that's the only way to keep us on our toes. <laughs> because as soon as we've got everything figured out, what do we start to do? We calculate. We exploit. We try to take advantage of it, isn't it? That's, that's what we do. Therefore, he's not giving up that secret. He keeps us getting... Karmani nirdahati kintu chabhakti bhaja means sometimes he's going to remove some karma that you should have suffered. If he doesn't want you to die, for example in a car accident. And sometimes he's not going to do that. As she said, it, it may be good for you, for your spiritual advancement. When we become devotees, or even when we declare to Krishna that I want to be a devotee, watch out. Because <laughs> he'll take you up on it. And, and from that point on, he's going, to, he's going to take personal interest, as we were mentioning with regard to your question. So, but the point is that he's not going to tell us. And is it true for the spiritual aspect also? Like some some situations, uh, like the suppose association of devotees, and some sometimes we get the association, but some yep. other times we may have to live with in a difficult situation. Yep. So that is also Krishna's arrangement, or uh, well, okay. this this is much much more subtle and difficult. This one. Because sometimes what we take to be a, a you know, we're in a position where we are able to take Krishna consciousness very nicely and we feel like we're advancing. And sometimes that's actually only good karma. Sometimes I'm just in my Jupiter period. <laughs> right? But we have to be careful there also because we don't know. And therefore, we don't want to assume that, you know, this is just something mundane karma when, in, in fact, it's Krishna's mercy. Imagine that offense. How Krishna will feel if we just dismiss his mercy as, you know, just karma. You see? So we have to be very careful there. When we suffer, we don't really know whether it's Krishna's mercy or whether it's our karma. When we, when everything is going great, also, we don't really know whether it's our good karma or whether it's Krishna's mercy. But when we get good association, that we have to say invariably is always Krishna's mercy. Because that is, the, that is the thing that elevates us. So that much we can say with confidence. When we get good association, means, you know, either perhaps generally satsanga, sadhu sangha, you know, but all the things that, you know, facilitate Krishna consciousness, that, that we can say generally is Krishna's mercy. Yeah. But, uh, and on the same lines as Prabhuji is asking, um, I think Ropa Goswami, Nectar of Devotion, says uh, one of the characteristics of Bhakti is Kleshagni, yep. which is uh, like burns the uh, like effects of material things into ashes. Mm -hmm. So if that is uh, 
characteristic of bhakti can we because then we can be confident whatever happens like prarabdha or aprarabdha because prarabdha means which is going to fructify in the future will be already burnt and it will not fructify but what is already manifested will be subdued yes so then we can be confident and we can sort of <laughs> anybody want to comment on this <laughs> maybe you can restate your question a little simpler uh the <clears throat> So one of the characteristics of bhakti is to burn the uh, effects of material yeah, activity. Krishna. Yeah. So um, and shubhada. These, yeah, these are, and then these creates are the excellence of shubhada. sadhana bhakti, not bhava bhakti or prema bhakti. Even in sadhana bhakti, you will get all of your miseries removed. Not all of them, but you will have miseries removed, and you will get all auspiciousness. Shubhada, kleshagna. These are the two characteristics when we embrace sadhana bhakti seriously. these things happen so so um that means when a devotee engages in uh, in the path of devotional service that is through the mercy of guru and uh, krishna only right yeah so that means if whatever difficulties come it will act as a mercy of krishna only not necessarily actually this is a very interesting point i was studying jeep goswami's commentary on bhakti samrat sindhu sometime recently about this point of prarabdha and aprarabdha karma. Now, prarabdha karma means whatever is on the docket for playing itself out in this lifetime before you die. You have to have some degree of prarabdha karma remaining. If all the prarabdha karma is destroyed, then what happens? Your body is destroyed because the body itself is also prarabdha karma. Some prarabdha karma has to stay. some degree has to stay which brings us back to his question about what stays and what goes right now it gets more complicated than that aprarabdha of the karma has three subdivisions that is to say the seed has been planted but not yet fruct- sprouted or fructified the seed has fructified but not yet sprouted and the seed has sprouted but it's not yet born fruit fruit would be the you know metaphorically speaking the product of the karma So all these stages of karma they all may or may not be present in a devotee's life even though we know that chanting the holy name for example destroys prarabdha karma even aprarabdha karma also but not all of it now some places in the shastra jeet goswami says they say that a person's uh, karma is immediately destroyed Anybody know the verse? Sadya Savanaya Kalpate. A person who chants the holy name, even if he's born in the family of dog eaters, he becomes immediately qualified to perform sacrifices. It's stated like that in the Bhagavatam. And in other, pla- in other places it says, Kravashaha, gradually that person becomes purified. So how do we reconcile this apparent contradiction? Jeep Goswami says it's like this. If you take a hundred lotus leaves and you stack them up back to back and you push a needle through it, you can say you've immediately pushed the needle through all hundred leaves, correct? But it's not immediate. First it goes through one leaf, then it goes through another leaf, then it goes through another leaf, then another leaf, hundred times, then it's finished. In this way, in the eternal scope of things, whatever degree to which we are experiencing our karma in this world it may i mean in, in the in the eternal scope of things it's immediate this life is nothing infinitude of eternity but at the same time it doesn't necessarily happen just at the snap of a finger it may take some time even within this life so that's a very subtle point but it's an important one to consider and this is why we see sometimes that even And somebody asked me this question when a devotee takes initiation we say the spiritual master accepts all of his karma so then what happens because we still suffer <laughs> so is that krishna's chastisement or it, it, back to the previous question it brings us this explanation is the answer to that question a devotee may not necessarily be free from all the karma right away it may take some time and it's an individual thing that Krishna is personally monitoring in each and every case. 
Is that okay? Yes. Anything else? <coughs> if not, then I think we should hmm. stop here. One more question. Um, you, you, you said that um, you know by not following the instruction of the spiritual master, especially in, in regards to the other 50%, that was Aparad. So from our position, what can we do? You know, what steps should we take, and how which how should we move forward? What do we do about Varnashram Dharma? Yes. This is a topic that I've heard many, many elder devotees that I respect comment on in the same way. Uh, Gopi Purana Dana Prabhu is one of them. Bhaktivedya Purna Swami is another one. Mm -hmm. Very learned people. Um, Mostly we can see that in ISKCON since 1970, well, 1970. Srila Prabhupada established certain farm communities and gave instructions about what we should do on them. Mostly the persons who purchased the land or tried to farm that land, they had no idea how to purchase land or how to farm land and had no idea what is good in that farmland and what is farming even for that matter. Most of the projects have failed, but not because of material inexpertise as much as a lack of understanding of dharma. In my opinion, for what it's worth, the word dharma is so multifarious and so subtle at the same time that it's not surprising that we don't understand it very well. But, you know, what these devotees have said is that in most cases where we see that Iskand's attempts at a implementing Varnashram, they have failed because the concept has not been fully formulated. The concept of Dharma to begin with, what to speak of dharma, Varnashram Dharma in particular, the very concept of Dharma doesn't exist in the English language because there's no need for it. We, we don't have demands in the English speaking world that, that require that word to exist. So the very first thing we have to do is to very carefully study this topic and make sure that we understand, first of all, what is dharma. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. that, that knowledge is lacking. But secondly, we have to be very sure what is it Prabhupada asked of us. I mentioned this a moment ago. We have to be, under, we have to be very clear what he expected of the farm communities, how they should be run, who should run them, etc. This kind of thing. And that's a very, 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 very big topic. They're having some success in India because instead of trying to get people from the city to, you know, purchase and run and direct farm projects, they're getting farmers who already know mm -hmm. what to do. And that's the, actually the intelligent approach. Just, as we mentioned earlier, Parasvatama, what is that? Sriyansa Dharma Dikonat, Paradharma Sanushtatama. You cannot imitate another's duty because you won't be able to. The Adhikar is just not there. So, in a, in a word, I'd say the answer to that question is that we have to very carefully study this topic in more depth because there's a lot of ignorance. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Is there, is there, I mean, is there any, like there's something that's never discussed, hardly. I mean, yeah, this, how we, how's it going to It's curious. Come it's part of, yeah. You know, you, you, some, it's certain things that Prabhupada used to repeat quite often, actually and vehemently also. Those things you, sometimes you don't hear them. Certain things. It's not just here either, it's in other topics also. There is, what that suggests subtly is that there are certain aspects of Prabhupada's teachings that we are not comfortable with. And that's really disturbing. But, you know, the things are there in the books still, so far. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Just one more question. Yeah. Uh, so most of the new devotees uh, come from a Mayavadi background, and yeah. they ask this question, what is wrong with doing charities? Because it's helping someone who is in need of help. It's not, actually. I mentioned already, you cannot help someone else. That person is locked into that person's crowd of the karma, and you cannot do a thing to help that person. I mean, you cannot just watch a person die in front yeah. of your eyes. Oh, that is a matter of dharma, though. <laughs> That's not a matter of being able to change anything. A compassionate person should show kindness to others. That is dharma. Yajnadana tapa karma natyajimiti. You like this. You should never give up sacrifice, austerity, and charity. Krishna says twice. 
in Bhagavad Gita. Again, that is a matter of dharma, and this we should understand. When I mentioned a moment ago that we don't understand dharma, this is an example. We're looking at things from a utilitarian viewpoint, which is not relevant to the world of dharma. We're looking at things in terms of consequentialism. I'm doing this because it works. I'm doing that in order to affect such and such a result. That is ignorance. The only reason to do anything is whether it is dharma or adharma. This is the Shastric perspective. When we live in that perspective, then the yumana will be cleaned up. We'll have pure water again. We'll get real food again. It's possible to turn these things around. I mentioned in the class a few weeks ago. Thirty years ago, you could drop a coin in the Yomana and watch it, watch it sit on the bottom. It was that clean. It's not possible now. But it's a, it's a problem that's only 30 years old. The problem is that how many people in this world are, are over 30 years old? They have no idea. Every generation comes in and assumes that it's always been this way, but it hasn't. Dharma has always been this way. Adharma has not always been here. Is it That's increasing each generation. And, and we learn that as we pass through several decades. By the end of about 60 or 70 years, we finally figure it out that it's getting worse. So is it because of the decline of dharma, all these things are happening? Like? Yeah. It's natural. It's not unnatural. But what is unnatural is, is our capitulation to that, you know, uh, you know, to, to the to the to the forces that are driving that, you know, we just we make no attempt to retain karma. That that's wrong, and I, I think that Prabhupada's instructions militate against that mentality. Okay, I think we have to stop now because it's getting late. So thank you very much. All glory to Shri Krishna. Uh,